Her husband had been murdered right in front of her eyes. And she barely escapes the same fate. She's only alive because this gun was jamming on him, and it was just her, her lucky day. But will her luck hold out as detectives dig into the case? It all depends on what's tougher to dodge, a bullet or a murder indictment. June 9, 1998. It was just before midnight when Myrtle Beach patrolman Scott Brown cruised a deserted stretch of beach just off the famed Grand Strand. Ahead, illuminated in the moonlight, he spotted a woman waving frantically. She flagged him down and uh, he came, drove over to her. The woman's husband, 24-year-old Brent Poole, was dead. What had started out as a romantic tryst on the beach ended with a bizarre robbery and two gunshots. An individual dressed in dark came over the sand dunes, had a gun, committed a robbery. During that robbery, the gunman shot Brent in the head. The killer had quickly vanished into the night. Within minutes, a dragnet covered the entire area. Forensic specialists scoured the beach for clues. We found some uh, shell casings, uh, which indicate that a, uh, an automatic or semi-automatic handgun was used. Even the most senior officers on the scene couldn't recall such a vicious crime. A random robbery on the beach at all, that's, that's extremely unusual. But to have a robbery and a murder on the beach is really unheard of. But the crime did have an eyewitness. The wife, she's very upset pretty much in shock. Renee Poole told police her husband had been gunned down while begging for his life. He knelt down over my husband and my husband said, please don't shoot me. But that's not all Renee remembered. And the details she provided would eventually lead investigators straight to the killer. Growing up in suburban Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Renee Summy always had a way with boys. She was very talkative, sweet-natured, bubbly. The boys really liked her. Brent Poole certainly liked Renee when the pair met one afternoon in 1991 in their high school parking lot. Brent was going home one day and his friend asked him for a ride home. And the friend also had Renee with him on that first trip home, Brent actually asked Renee for a date. Brent was a senior. Renee, only a freshman, readily accepted. He came from a good family, good Christian family, and he was a good student, had high grades. He was just a good boy. And when Brent got Renee pregnant in March of 1995, barely three months after she'd turned 17, he asked her to marry him. When he proposed, he did it here in the house, got down on his knees the old-fashioned way. Both sides of the family were wondering how it was going to work out, because life is tough enough as a young married couple, and then when you start out already with a kid, you know, it's even worse. Luckily, at age 21, Brent already had a promising career. Brent was a diesel mechanic. He worked for... Mack truck in Charlotte. He was making quite a bit of money for a young man and was particularly good at it. Brent and Renee even managed to buy a small house in Moxville, a bedroom community outside Winston-Salem. They had bought a, a really nice home, kind of a starter home, but in a nice neighborhood in North Carolina. I mean, from the outside, it really looked like they had it going on. But after their daughter was born in 1996, Renee and Brent started having money trouble. They had refinanced their house, and I think they'd gotten in pretty deep. So in the spring of 1997, at Brent's suggestion, Renee took a job at the Silver Fox Show Club, a topless bar a few blocks from downtown Winston-Salem. Brent was very proud that his wife was a dancer. She enjoyed that, that sort of lifestyle and, and that fast-paced, you know, a lot of action. And Renee's new job looked like it would put the couple's money problems behind them. She can make 
she told me 200 to 400 dollars a night uh, as a stripper cash wasn't all that renee brought home from the club either she did have relationships with some of the girls that work there sexual relationships and according to rumor around the club brent encouraged it he seemed very eager to experiment within the marriage renee however also experimented outside her marriage with men she met at the club there were various sexual escapades and renee had multiple uh, affairs many of the men she would have relationships with were sort of one night stands one wasn't in the spring of 1998 renee started seeing a computer tech and part-time dj from the silver fox named john boyd frazier John was a really, really sweet guy. John was like a big teddy bear. He was also generous to the girls at the club. John Frazier did take in uh, several dancers to stay at his house and let them live there. He thought he was helping these girls, and that's just the way he was. He just was a caring person. And Frazier's generous nature, according to a co-worker, may have been what attracted Renee. She was thinking... He had money, and when I asked John about it, he said, I think she thinks I'm going to buy her boobs. In the spring of 1998, Renee and Brent started having problems at home. He liked to go four-wheeling with his buddies. Renee thought he ought to be home helping with the baby more, and he wanted to be out with his buddies. On May 7th, while Brent was at work, she and her two-year-old daughter moved in with Frazier. Renee grabs her stuff and takes off. Brent comes home to an empty house. Furniture's gone, child's gone, wife's gone. He's completely distraught. But would Renee follow up and leave Brent for good? Just days after moving in with Frazier, she met with an attorney. Her divorce attorney advised her that you left the, the marriage. Uh, you work at a, at a strip club. You're basically uh, misguided and misinformed if you think there's any chance of you getting getting the house for full custody of that child. Renee, at that point, started rethinking her decision to leave Brent. She was going to reconcile with Brent and uh, try to make the marriage work. John Frazier, after only a week of living with Renee, didn't try to stop her. I think it was kind of a mutual thing. They both decided that neither one of them was really into the other as much as they had thought they were. On May 12th, Renee packed up her things and went back home to her husband. He took her back in with open arms. He wanted to reconcile. Renee appeared just as anxious to patch things up. At the end of May, with the couple's anniversary approaching, she even proposed they take a trip to celebrate their reconciliation. Renee wanted to go down to Myrtle Beach and have kind of a new honeymoon on the third anniversary, a new start. Brent didn't need much convincing. This is just what Brent thinks they need. He, he thinks this is a great idea. He's just really trying to hold the marriage and the family together and, you know, would stop at nothing. He's trying to cement their relationship, just trying to make it stronger. Brent would do whatever it took to keep Renee. Unfortunately, he wasn't the only one. Anytime that you mix two or more men competing for one woman, there's going to be a bad end to it. The pool's trip to the beach started out well enough. Checking into the Carolina Winds Resort, the family spent several days in the sand and sun. However, on the evening of June 9th, Renee had arranged to spend the evening out with Brent, alone. She contacts the hotel about arranging for a babysitter the night of their anniversary. But once the sitter arrived, Renee's big plan nearly backfired. Brent and Renee's child starts to cry. And Brent's trying to console her, you know, and to, you know, just talk to her and tell her everything's going to be all right. Renee eventually got him out of the, uh, the motel room, and the, the babysitter was able to calm down the child. Crisis averted. Renee and Brent hit the bars along King's Highway, Myrtle Beach's main drag. They proceeded to eat dinner, um, had a few drinks, and then played a few games of pool. Then, a little after 11, Renee suggested something special to cap off the evening. She suggested to Brent that they might have a, have a sexual relationship in the dunes. 
As luck would have it, the stretch of beach next to their hotel offered a secluded spot. The hotel they stayed at, the Carolina Winds, north of there is nothing but residents and woods. This part of the beach is really, really quiet, secluded. Brent immediately said yes to Renee's suggestion. It's his anniversary. They've had a couple of drinks, and they're going to go out in the, under the stars and, and you know, have a, have a honeymoon. So he's pretty, pretty motivated. Brent's motivation was clear. But what happened next would leave police wondering if Renee's motive on the beach that night was seduction or a setup. At 11.45 on the evening of June 9th, a patrolman from the Myrtle Beach PD was cruising the water's edge in his four-wheel drive. Myrtle Beach Police Department has a beach patrol unit, and uh, they're driving up and down the beach to make sure everything is safe. He just entered the deserted stretch of sand north of the Carolina winds when he spotted something, a young woman waving frantically. It was Renee. She flagged him down and uh, he came, drove over to her. Renee was hysterical. She had reason to be, according to what she breathlessly told the patrolman. This guy in black shot Brent twice in the head. It was shocking. This beach patrol officer is usually dealing with a wallet stolen or you know, something like that. But a stolen wallet was only the beginning of Renee's story. This figure dressed all in black wearing a ski mask robs them, uh, takes Brent's wallet, watch, and some other items. Renee said she and Brent had cooperated with the robber following his orders. She had been forced to lay down in the sand along with her husband. Not that, according to Renee, their cooperation had done them any good. She heard several gunshots and realized that her husband had been shot. Coming up, to uncover why Brent was shot, investigators must first answer another question. Why wasn't Renee? She wasn't even so much as, as you know, slapped, tied up, blindfolded, nothing. June 9th, 1998, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It was supposed to be a special date night for Renee Poole and her husband, Brent. But at 11.45 that evening, minutes after a seaside tryst to celebrate their third anniversary, Renee Poole was frantically flagging down an officer of the beach patrol. Her husband had just been shot. His first step is to, to secure the scene. He gets, gets Renee Poole into the truck. He goes to Brent, checks his vital signs, sees that it's, it's very obvious that he is, has already passed away. One of the wounds was a contact wound under the chin. The second wound was what we call a close range wound just below the entrance to the left ear. Either of the wounds was a fatal wound. Leaving Brent on the sand, the beach patrolman returned to his truck and radioed for backup. By the time Detective Bill Franz arrived a few minutes later, law enforcement had already surrounded the beach. The uniformed guys did have a perimeter. They were securing the scene where the body was as best they could. The scene, however, yielded few clues other than Brent's blood and a handful of 9mm bullets. We found some uh, shell casings uh, which indicate that a uh, an automatic or semi-automatic handgun was used. We found some live rounds back where the body was. We were able to retrieve four um, bullets from the scene, some money, some pennies were found, also a wedding band. Uh, the button to uh, Brent's shirt was found. And of, of course, the blood of uh, Brent was found there on the scene also. There was no gun, however. The killer was still armed and dangerous and perhaps stalking another victim somewhere on the resort community's famed Grand Strand. It created a lot of, really, a, a lot of, of fear and concern. That's our gem of our community. I mean, that's our economic engine for Myrtle Beach. It thrives on the tourist dollar. I think there was a great deal of pressure on the police. The police responded accordingly. The search for Brent's killer quickly became a full-fledged manhunt. We had bloodhounds called out to the scene to see if we could track down the suspect. 
they had a scent which very possibly could have been the murderers. Uh, the dog followed that scent until the road, and they reported back that they could not find the scent past the road. But if the killer had stashed a getaway car, no one had seen it. The crime scene at the beach was growing cold. But there was still one possibility the police hadn't yet addressed. In cases where a spouse is murdered, one of the first persons that the police always look at is the other spouse. But in this case, the spouse appeared to be genuinely traumatized. She was in shock. She was hysterical. None of us had any reason to believe that uh, Renee Poole was in any way involved in this. To make sure, just before 1 a.m. on June 10th, investigators ushered a distraught Renee into the Myrtle Beach Police Department, where her hands were tested for gunpowder residue. Even though she's in distress and that kind of thing, is that uh, we had to treat her as a suspect. The test came back negative, so detectives led Renee into an interrogation room. Inside, she gave an audio taped account of her husband's death. My husband said, please don't shoot me. And the guy asked him, why shouldn't I? My husband said, because I have a daughter and I love her very much. The police, as far as Renee knew, still considered her a witness. But out of her earshot, the investigators were starting to wonder. During the course of that interview, they had reason enough to believe that, you know, something was up and they didn't feel right about it. And it wasn't just a few nagging details. It was the entire scenario. A random robbery on the beach at all, that's, that's extremely unusual. But to have a robbery and a murder on the beach is really unheard of. Thinking back in my memory upon the beach itself, I couldn't remember a murder. But the oddest thing about Renee's story, from the police perspective, was that she was alive to tell it. If you shoot somebody twice in the head, that would be to eliminate them as a potential witness against you later. And thinking, and thinking that through, why does she not have two shots to the head? Because now, instead of being a witness to a robbery, she would then be a witness to a robbery and a murder. If Renee Poole had been shot, left for dead, and she had survived, then that would be one thing. That happens occasionally. But, I mean, she wasn't even so much as, as you know, slapped, tied up, blindfolded, nothing. In the interrogation room, Renee provided a possible answer. I heard the gun click like there was nothing in the chamber. Okay. Two to three times. Maybe, yeah. Which indicate the gun must have jammed several times. Yeah, at which time the uh, person had to uh, eject the, the round. The live rounds found on the beach seemed to confirm Renee's account. It was just her, her lucky day, per se. He realized that I've already shot twice, I've got to go. That could be the explanation in this case. Around 2 a.m., during a break in Renee's interrogation, police contacted Brent's parents with the news that their son had been murdered. First thing in my mouth was, oh my gosh, was Renee with them? Well, yes, ma'am, uh, she was. And the cop, and one of the parents told our detectives, you don't know the whole story. The pools quickly filled the police in on Brent and Renee's unusual relationship. The marriage had been rocky at times. Um, she had other boyfriends and girlfriends. They told us that she had, she was living with a, uh, a man that she had met where she worked. And that where she worked at was at a strip club. That's when everybody started catching on that there was a lot more to the story than a simple robbery and murder on the beach. The pool family were definitely immediately suspect of uh, Renee being involved in the death. Brent's parents also gave police the name of Renee's boyfriend, John Frazier. We called Winston-Salem Police Department and explained to them that we needed an officer to go, uh, in our mind, immediately to John Boyd Frazier's house to see if he could locate him. While the police in Winston-Salem tried to track down Frazier, Detectives in Myrtle Beach took Renee back into the interrogation room and confronted her about the affair. My son and I did have problems um, a, a little while ago. Uh, I moved out, moved in with a friend for about a week, and it was a male. 
Who is this friend? His name? Brian. Um, John Frazier. She confirmed what Brent Poole, her husband's parents, had told us. Renee admitted she'd seen other men. But she also said that the affairs, including the one with Frazier, were over. When Renee moved back in with Brent, she had told John she didn't want anything to do with him, to leave her alone. But had Frazier listened? As the detectives put pressure on her, Renee wasn't so sure. Was this John that did this? I don't know. You don't know? No. So it could have been John? Could have been. Coming up, determining if Frazier is a suspect comes down to how fast he can drive. It appeared to the officer that Frazier had been asleep. Indeed, Frazier said he was asleep. By 5 a.m. on the morning of June 10th, 1998, Brent Poole had barely been dead for five hours, but Myrtle Beach police already had a promising suspect in the murder. His name was John Frazier, the man Brent's wife Renee had briefly left him for a month earlier. She was asked if John Frazier was a person that, uh, that had shot Brent, which at times she uh, told us that it could have been him. There was one way to find out. Myrtle Beach investigators contacted police in Frazier's hometown of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and asked them to send an officer out to his house. We're kind of hoping that, that maybe he's not there. But we're kind of hoping he's down in the Myrtle Beach area. Unfortunately for the investigators, when the Winston-Salem patrolman knocked on John Frazier's front door, he answered it. It appeared to the officer that Frazier had been asleep. Chances at that point dwindled that John Boy Frazier was actually here in Myrtle Beach and did this. In Winston-Salem, the patrolman let Frazier go back to bed. Later that same morning, Renee's parents arrived in Myrtle Beach to pick up their daughter. I told them if they found out anything to please let us know. Detective Altman said, oh, we'll let you know. And Detective Altman's demeanor made one thing clear. The investigators sensed Renee was holding back, perhaps to protect her ex-boyfriend. But why? It was at that point in the investigation a long shot he was behind Brent's murder. For John to drive to Myrtle Beach, commit a murder, come back to Winston-Salem, park the car in the back, then answer his front door for a Winston-Salem police officer. It's not impossible, but it's almost impossible. It took like five hours to drive from Myrtle Beach to uh, Winston-Salem. Had Frazier somehow managed to commit the murder and make it home with just minutes to spare? The investigators were starting to wonder. We found out from his workplace that he had been scheduled to work the night of the murder, but had uh, asked for the night off. June 12th, detectives from Myrtle Beach drove to North Carolina to interview Renee a second time. She arrived with an attorney who was uh, an attorney for her sister during a divorce proceeding several years before. At first, Renee told the same story she had before, that a man in black had ambushed her and Brent. Was John on the beach that night? No, not that, that I know of, no. The last time he answered that question, he said it could have been. It could have been. Moments later, Renee's attorney stopped the interview. Her attorney told the detectives, please give us a few minutes alone. Let me talk to my client alone. But just as the investigators assumed the interrogation was over, Renee and her attorney came back into the room. And this time, when they sat down, it was her attorney who asked the first question. Do you have any further information, or do you want to change that story as it would be believed? Told the traitor to kill you. Her attorney, who wasn't a criminal attorney, told her to talk to the police. They were excited as pigs in mud. I mean, she just talked and talked because her attorney said to talk. And this time, there were no maybes when it came to the killer's identity. There's no doubt in your mind that that was John Gray. She knew it was him because of his voice and his build and his mannerisms. 
When detectives asked why she hadn't implicated him sooner, Renee said she'd first had to convince herself that Frazier had been the killer. I wanted to make sure that I knew it was him. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in my heart, I knew it was him, but in my mind, I just didn't want to accept the fact that he could have done that. Renee said, it shocked me that he would do such a thing. I had no idea that John Boy Frazier was capable of anything like this. After all, as she'd previously explained to the investigators, she'd made it clear to John the affair was over. They broke it off after she went back home to Brent. Had Frazier killed Brent out of jealousy or in hopes of getting Renee back? Renee's interrogation provided enough for a murder warrant against him. Police arrested John Frazier on the evening of June 13th. Inside the interrogation room, unlike Renee, he wasn't willing to talk. He wanted an attorney and, and refused to make any statements. That left investigators with a slew of unanswered questions. For starters, how did Frazier end up on the beach that night? John Frazier just didn't look into a crystal ball and say, you know, they're going to be in Myrtle Beach on June 9th. Had Frazier followed the family down? Or was there another explanation, one Renee was reluctant to reveal? A great stripper. You know, you sort of give the image of what somebody wants, but without really giving it to them. There was no doubt in order to get anything out of Renee Poole, she was going to have to be leaned on. And unfortunately for Renee, she tripped up the moment she recanted her first story about an unknown gunman. She committed a crime by giving a false statement and by... Uh, by lying to the to police. So on the same night they picked up Frazier, deputies also drove to a Winston-Salem funeral home with a warrant for Renee's arrest on charges of obstructing justice. He was actually attending a, uh, a wake for her husband, her dead husband. They arrested her outside of the funeral home, knowing that the funeral was the next day. For the third time in four days, Renee Poole was back in a police interrogation room this time without her attorney. She initially uh, stated that she had no knowledge that John Boy Frazier would come down and do such a dastardly act. But as the clock ticked well past midnight, Detective Terry Altman kept the pressure on. She can almost hear Terry get a little bit sterner with her and a little bit more demanding of her about the truth. Even if he had to resort to a lie to get it. Although Frazier had refused to talk, Detective Altman hinted that he'd actually implicated Renee in a plot to kill her husband. They had told Renee the whole time that Frazier did it, that he said he did it and implicated her and was going to put it all off on her. Gradually, after more than two hours in the interrogation room, Renee's story began to change. She kept sort of peeling back slowly layers of the onion. Renee claimed it was Frazier who'd approached her about killing Brent. He didn't tell me who was going to do it. He told me whoever was going to do it would, would know what they were doing. But he told me that he had done it before and he could do it again. She didn't implicate herself very much. A bit around the edges. Um, but she never really took direct responsibility. Renee did admit that she'd known about the murder plot, but she claimed she hadn't taken it seriously. He said something about he was going to do one thing, he was going to do another thing. I said, well, do it. I said, I'll think you have the balls to do it. And then later on in, in that conversation, I told him, don't do it. Please don't do it, don't do it. She did not go fully into detail. She gave enough indication that she was involved and that she knew Brent was going to be killed that night down on the beach. It was, however, more than enough detail for a murder indictment. To do her part, she had to get her husband uh, out on that uh, isolated beach area. And doing these things, yes, she is just as guilty of the murder as, as the person who pulled the trigger. The next morning, June 14, 1998, as her husband was being laid to rest in a Winston-Salem cemetery, Renee was formally charged with his murder. And as promised, 
the DA prepared to seek the death penalty. To murder her husband on the on the day of their third anniversary. I mean, my goodness, how how reprehensible an act could this be? Renee, at her arraignment in South Carolina on June 18th, pled not guilty. She also, on the advice of her new criminal attorney, recanted her alleged confession. She said her confession was some sort of horrible misunderstanding and had been twisted and and sort of coerced out of her by the police. They put. Uh, improper psychological coercion um, on Renee. Questions like, you knew this, you uh, knew it was going to happen, you set him up, didn't you? You set him up, you know, uh, tell us the truth. We know the truth. The case against Renee was built around the premise that John Frazier had been the shooter. But as they prepared for her November 1999 trial, prosecutors faced some serious problems. There was no other evidence that implicated Renee or John Frazier other than Renee's statements. Coming up, two eyewitnesses hold the key to the case. But will they confirm the prosecution's theory or Renee's original account of a robbery? They were also staying at the Carolina Winds and had seen an individual dressed all in black. In November of 1999, Renee Poole was back in South Carolina. Only this time, she hadn't come for a romantic getaway. Instead, the former stripper was on trial for murder. Accused alongside boyfriend John Frazier of conspiring to kill her husband, Brent, Renee would stand trial first. They were hoping that if they got a conviction on Renee, that John Boyd Frazier would plead guilty. In his opening statement to the jury on November 10th, prosecutor Greg Hembry recounted how Renee had allegedly lured her husband into Frazier's line of fire. A woman that will take her husband into the sand dunes to, to have sex with him, knowing that in a few minutes he's going to be killed. You're talking about an evil, evil woman. The jury didn't have to take Hembry's word for it either. On November 11th, the DA called Detective Altman to the stand and walked the jury through each of Renee's interrogations. Each uh, interview was played for the, uh, for the jury so they could hear in her own words what she said. He told me whoever was going to do it would, would know what they were doing. On cross, however, the defense shifted the jury's focus to what the detectives said. They told her that uh, John Frazier had confessed to being the shooter, and he put all of the blame on Renee. It wasn't true. John never admitted his involvement in the crime at all. They lied to her. Um, I don't like to use the word lie, but that's a good way to describe it here. As he answered the defense's questions, Detective Altman didn't deny lying to Renee. In fact, he argued that lies were a necessary part of the job. When we leaned on Renee, it was a proper thing to do. It's okay for the police to lie during an investigation to, uh, to get to the truth. But had they gotten to the truth? On November 12th, the trial's third day, prosecutors started presenting evidence to confirm the plot Renee had supposedly confessed to. Her plan was to lure him down to the beach in a, in a dark, secluded area so John Frazier could kill him. John Frazier was merely a tool. As proof Renee had set up the hit, the babysitter she had hired testified that Renee had seemed awfully anxious to start her big night out with Brent. According to the babysitter, she's tapping her foot, she's looking at her watch. We've got to go, we've got to go right now. Was Renee simply anxious to spend her anniversary alone with Brent? Or was she trying to keep her murder plot on schedule? To strengthen their theory that Renee steered her husband out of the hotel and into Frazier's line of fire, prosecutors needed a witness that could place the boyfriend on that beach the night Brent was murdered. But they didn't have one witness. They had two. An older couple from Virginia, the witnesses had spent the weekend of Brent's murder at the same hotel as the Pools. By coincidence, they were there celebrating one of their wedding anniversaries. The couple had first contacted police the day after the murder to report something suspicious they'd seen the night before. 
they had seen an individual dressed all in black. And they said, well, my wife and I were down at the beach and we saw this guy. It kind of spooked us. The sighting at first appeared to confirm Renee's initial story, the one about a mysterious robber dressed all in black. It's in the summertime. He's walking around in a black, looks like a black sweatsuit, dark clothes. Uh, he's got his hood pulled up over his head at, at, at certain points. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. It looked really strange. But once the police had Frazier in custody, they'd contacted the witnesses from Virginia for a follow-up. We used a booking photo of John Boy Frazier to put together a, uh, a photographic lineup. They did a, each look at the picture separately and both picked uh, John Frazier out as a person that they saw. And in their testimony on November 12th, both husband and wife swore that without a doubt, John Frazier had been in Myrtle Beach the night of the murder. It just struck such a nerve in them that he was up to no good that it just became embedded in both of their minds. But was the face embedded in their minds actually that of John Frazier? On cross, the defense did their best to raise doubt. The leading cause of wrongful convictions is eyewitness identification testimony. The time of night that occurred, the lighting on the beach, that just didn't make logical sense that they could have seen the face of anyone that night, much less John Boyd Frazier. And if it had been Frazier on the beach that night, the defense claimed he'd been incredibly lucky to beat the cops to his door less than six hours later. You'd have to drive like a bat out of hell to make that drive by the time the police are knocking on the door at 5.30 in the morning. And doubts about Frazier's ability to make that drive, according to the defense, also raised some very reasonable ones about Renee's guilt. If Renee's involved solely because she's linked to a plan that John Frazier had to kill Brent Poole, if Frazier wasn't the shooter, Renee's not involved. Of course, Renee had allegedly confessed. So when the defense started presenting its case on the afternoon of November 12th, it was crucial to cast doubt on that confession. To do it, her attorneys called a psychiatrist to the stand who testified that Renee's confession was the result of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Her husband had been murdered right in front of her eyes. That's going to be, that's going to put anybody in shock. Renee's shock, the defense claimed, made it very easy for the detectives to manipulate her. Worse, according to the defense, they'd applied pressure to the brand new widow's most vulnerable point. The police detectives were telling her that she would never see her daughter again if she didn't cooperate with them and tell them the truth. And again, the truth that they were telling Renee they wanted to hear was that John Frazier was the shooter. The detectives hadn't beaten a confession out of Renee, but according to the defense, they'd come awfully close. Every parent in this country would say something that's not true to save their relationship with their children. Their biggest defense was that they think she was coerced into, into confessing. And the detectives, the defense claimed, were desperate for a confession. It's not good for business for tourists to come down and, and then get killed. It was, according to the defense, in Myrtle Beach's best interest for Brent's death to be something other than a random robbery. The detectives had their own scenario. They wanted her to say she did it. The pieces have come together, Renee, and what we knew pretty much after that first night, we knew that you had to be involved in it. Renee Poole, again, was, was in an environment that I think she would have said anything she needed to say at the time, just get out of there. At 10 o'clock on the evening of November 12th, the defense rested its case without putting Renee on the stand. After all, according to her attorney, she'd already said enough. The jury in Renee Poole's murder trial spent most of Saturday, November 13th, 1999, in deliberations. It was, her attorney assumed, a good sign for the defense. We were pretty relaxed, and we felt like the jury was taking its time. Renee spent the time planning her victory celebration. She's laughing, 
She's happy. She borrowed one of the lawyers, one of her lawyer's cell phones, and, and through, through the whole day was making plans for a party. Finally, after more than eight hours of deliberation, the jury announced it had reached a verdict. They deliberated quite a long time. Typically, a, a murder jury will take three, four hours. We sent several questions back out to the judge by the bailiff. We probably took two or three ballots before it was unanimous. At 9 p.m., the court clerk read the jury's verdict. My heart liked to drop when I heard the verdict. Renee Poole was guilty. She completely fell apart, um, crying. My investigator and I had to just hold her up to keep her from just collapsing. The judge sentenced Renee to life in prison without parole. Her lawyers filed an immediate appeal. There is very little physical direct evidence, uh, just very little. It was all built up on the lifestyle. She worked at a strip joint. So that hurt Renee. Although, in the minds of the police and prosecutors, it ended up hurting Brent even more. Working in a strip club, having an illicit affair, divorce was just not going to be an option because she was going to lose essentially everything out of it. It was more logical in her mind to kill him. And Renee's reconciliation with Brent? It was, according to the DA, simply the first step of her deadly betrayal. It's not going to be a very good cover-up if she's living with her boyfriend and all of a sudden her husband drops dead. She needs to get back in to carry out the plan. 